He unrolled the papyrus scrolls and considered the words therein. He felt enriched, better armed to deal with the next day. It was not until he was at peace alone that Lucius, Metellus, Anguius realized the great responsibility that he now faced. He was not commanding legions, but he was, in a more intimate way, charged with the lives of close to 500 men. He knew many of them, too, like an eagle with her hatchlings on some far-flung eyry. It was within his power to either push the men into a dark, craggy void, or to rouse their courage to fly into the heavens, uncaring of what lay below. Their lives were in his hands, he hoped, and in some way feared that they trusted him implicitly. Men were often sent to die on the fields of foreign lands, and only too often had he seen the actions of arrogant generals and cowards cost lives. For Lucius, when he boarded the black boat for the other world, he did not want throngs of dead and vengeful warriors he had led awaiting him on the sad shore. The thought was too terrifying for any man of arms. As evening swirled the sky in colors of plume and pomegranate, Lucius found himself walking amid the olive trees the olive trees at the bottom of the plateau. He had finished his inspection of the camp and took the opportunity to walk alone for a while. Away from the camp's noise, the silvery leaves reminded him of summers at his family's Etrurian estate. As a child, he would play among the trees along the stream on hot days, sometimes alone or with Argus, other times with his sister, Aline. He had not written to her since Alexandria. Forgot how much he missed her. The years had flown. He stopped abruptly, froze. A serpent was coiling its way around his ankle. It slithered and stopped, as though feeling Lucius's eyes on it. He thought of reaching for his sword, but he knew that but knew that could frighten it into attack. Besides, he was in a land where snakes were highly sacred. Sacrilege was not something he wanted hanging over his head. He breathed calmly and watched as the creature moved on, like quicksilver through hot sand. Lucius smiled to himself. Stay still, Lucius. Argus's blade ripped through the silent air to sever the serpent's body. It shuddered several times and then was still, its blood clotting the dusty ground. Why did you do that? Lucius turned on Argus, his reverie broken. Argus protested, shocked by his friend's reaction. What do you mean? I just saved your life. It was moving on. Lucius looked down at the pathetic remnants, ants already crawling on the bloody pits, the bloody bits. Those are sacred here, Argus. Oh, get over it. You can't believe that. The last thing I want is to watch you spasm and foam at the mouth before I have to carry your dead body to the rest the rest of the way to Lambaesis. Good thing I came down here when I did. Lucius just shook his head, unable to comprehend his friend's actions at times, his disregard. He did not want to argue. What was it you wanted anyway? Argus frowned. He knew that Lucius would not agree with him this time. Just letting you know that Eligius and Garai are back. I think something happened in the town. Perfect. Lucius rubbed his tightening jaw, turned and walked back up the plateau embankment. As he went, he heard several hollow thumps and knew that Argus was cutting up the rest of the mangled serpent in frustration. When Eligius and Garai entered the command tent, Lucius was standing, arms crossed, staring absently at the map on the wall. The two men stopped and looked at each other before speaking. What happened? Lucius spoke first. It wasn't that bad, Lucius. I mean, Tribune. Garai forgot there were others just outside the tent. They were supposed to address Lucius formally around the men. Eligius continued, Apparently two of our men were gambling at one of the taverns. They say that two of the local auxiliar, auxiliaries cheated, and when they called them on it, 
a fight broke out. You know how these things work. One man throws a punch and then the whole bloody place is in an uproar. Lucius's face was stern, thoughtful. We're trying to keep the honest people of this region warm to us. We're here to help them against the nomads who raid their farms. But how are we going to do this? How are we going to nurture the peoples' trust in us in Rome if we start brawls in their home? We won't, Garai continued. There were several witnesses who said that the local guys started the brawl. I paid the tavern keeper and made a show of reprimanding our men, even though they are innocent. Doesn't matter if they are innocent or not. Discipline them. Put them on latrine duty for the next six days, digging and filling the pits. That isn't a bit harsh? No, listen to me, both of you. We need to maintain our discipline. That's what makes this army. Do it. Fine. Yes, Tribune. The two men saluted. One more thing, Lucius remembered. Did you stop by the offices of the city prefect to tell him I would be by tomorrow? Yes, we did, Eligius answered. His name's Cassius Melodorus, another fat-assed merchant-turned-frontier administrator. We told him that you would be by after you visited the baths. He's expecting you. Good, thanks to you both. Lucius smiled half-heartedly to them, knew that they thought he was overreacting. He tried not to let it anger him. By the time the sun had risen over the plains to set alight the new day, Lucius was riding along the road to Cyrene with Argus, Antonilus, their two centuries, and a small contingent of cavalry, including Brutus. The young tribune had been eager to see the city, while Carthage had always been the wealthiest and most prosperous city, prosperous city of Africa. Proconsularis, the other large cities of the neighboring provinces, especially Cyrene, had begun to rival the might of the former Punic capital. To protect their wealthy populace from attacks, the cities were fortified with some walls. Each city built monuments to display its wealth, bath complexes, theaters, libraries, and temples to the gods. Lucius looked forward to walking the civilized streets and experiencing all of the stimuli that he had missed in the desert. Chapter 3. Festinere via et third modem. Bustling streets and baths. Had Lucius known it was market day in the Cyrene, he might have reconsidered going at all, especially with 200 men. Not that he doubted Argus and Antonilus's grasp of command. It was the locals he was worried about and how they would react to such a large force of outside troops, especially after the previous night's incident. He hoped that the business his men would bring would help the people to forget. People gazed absently at the side of the tribune. As he made his way through the press of sweaty flesh, his helmet's crest visible above all else, the sun had risen. It was stifling. This was a far cry from the quiet of the open desert. It was an assault on the senses. He was pushed and pulled from all sides by men haggling over the price of animals, spices and pots. Old haggardly women yelled at him as he attempted to make his way through the throng of bodies. Occasionally, merchants would grab Lucius's arm in an attempt to drag him into their stalls, where they wished to sell him bits of pilfered armor and weapons. It did not matter that he was a Roman officer or that his weapons were far superior to any the merchants had ever seen. On market day, any passerby was fair game. Why else would anyone be there? The variety of people amazed Lucius. There were merchants, both rich and poor, peasants performing menial tasks for anyone who would pay them. Rich ladies paraded themselves in perfumed litters carried by four to eight slaves, while well-to-do citizens pushed into the fray with their own slaves in tow. Shopping for household items in the midst of the chaos, local auxiliary groups attempted to maintain some semblance of order as they rubbed along with everyone else. Nubians, Egyptians, Greeks, Massilians, Parthians, and countless other peoples were all mixed in an orgy of buying and selling.
Lucius glanced back in the direction from which he had come, could see the centurion's crests of Antonilus and Argus caught in the middle of the animal market as a herd of camels swarmed about them. Argus's voice raged above the din of murmuring dromedaries. He smiled to himself at the thought of his friends' progress toward the baths. Hindered by both beast and merchant, they would need to bathe after that. Finally, Lucius neared the forum at the center of town. It was packed to capacity. Local politicians waved their arms about in dramatic arcs. Street performers enacted bits of classic comedies. And fortune tellers read what the fates had in store had in store and scattered bits of bone for those who wanted a little guidance. On the right, Lucius spotted snake charmers playing their magical flutes. Their reptilian audience swayed to the lulling music like cradled babies to their mothers' nightly hymns. Lucius moved along, noticed the slave market to his left. There was a large wooden platform on which the slave trader paraded his goods so that the buyers could make their choice. Lucius stood for a moment and watched. To one side of the dais, the slaves were bunched together awaiting their turn. Children, men, and women. Lucius felt his heart seize up at the sight of boys and girls, no more than ten years old, who would be sold as laborers, house slaves, or other unthinkable uses. There were also many many stunning women to be auctioned off. No doubt they would fetch the highest price from rich matrons who needed body servants or rich men who wished to impress their friends by displaying an array of concubines about their homes. One girl of about 22 was brought up next. She was stunning in every respect with golden hair, green eyes, and a figure to render Venus jealous. She wore only the slightest of coverings, intended to show off her to show her off. No doubt she was taken from home somewhere in the northern provinces, perhaps Germania or Britannia. And now, the auctioner's voice rose above the bubbling crowd, who could resist this young beauty? He yanked the girl closer. She made a weak attempt to pull away. His hand closed tightly about her waist. Any takers for this virgin barbarian? The man's gaze concentrated upon the row of rich merchants in front. The virginity of the girl in question was unlikely. The pained, tired look in her eyes telling otherwise. She tried to hide behind her long hair. Lucius, who could see above the heads of the crowd, felt a pang of dread for the young women when an old, rich-looking Egyptian tossed a heavy pouch of Oria at the traders' feet. The girl's eyes filled with tears as she was handed over to the lecher, half naked and afraid. Then, at that moment, as if looking into the crowd for help, she held Lucius's eyes and shook her head pleadingly. The torment of seeing this perfect being dragged away on the end of a rope held by that pig was almost too much. Lucius hated feeling so helpless and angry, for there was nothing he could do. He tore himself from the poor creature's gaze, turned abruptly, and shoved his way through the crowd toward the other side of the forum and the girls of the prefect. The girl shut her eyes and broke down. The reality of her situation all too harsh and terrifying. After his sweaty journey through the crowds, Lucius finally arrived at the baths. On the outside, the roof of the basilica bulged out above the surrounding buildings. Lucius admired the strong simplicity of the structure and wondered if it was the same on the inside. It was relatively quiet in that part of the town with everyone on the main street and in the the forum for the market. Only a few citizens were in or came out of the bath complex as he approached. 